This is uh, research that I've done with Dr. Abram, but uh, collaborators are also our team, Bolshikov and Jeff Asgarius, as he mentioned earlier. And I'm going to be talking about uh, an, an operation or a set of operations called interleaving on these path sets that Dr. Abram already introduced earlier today. Um, just to summarize uh, the definition um, that he gave earlier, if you have a finite graph uh, with a marked initial vertex and you have labeled directed edges with the label taken from a specific alphabet, then the path set generated by this is the set of sequences that can be presented by an infinite walk on that graph. I'm always going to assume that if I show you a path set, the marked one is the vertex at the top, just conventionally. Now, a, uh, a single path set can have multiple presentations. As we see here, um, these two presentations are different, but they actually give the same path set. Uh, right resolving means that if you know what vertex you're at and I tell you which label to follow, you'll know exactly what vertex to go. So here, if I tell you if you're at vertex x and I tell you to follow a 0, you'll go down to y. But here, if I tell you to follow a 0, you won't know if you should go to B or C until I tell you the next one. So right resolving uh, presentations are nicer in the sense that they encode the, the um, set of basically past information encodes uh, exactly where you are in terms of your follower set. So um, they, and every path set does have a right resolving presentation. So that's good. There's the, the technical definition. Okay. So this interleaving operation that I've been studying, uh, this is the formal definition, but I think the best way to explain it is to just give you a quick example. So let's take these two path sets, P and Q, and a presentation, uh, these are both finite path sets. Let me just show you a presentation of P. If this is the marked initial vertex, then you can just put self loops on these three bottom vertices and label these with ones, these with zeros, I believe, and yeah, these with twos. And that should present the path set P, and you can do something similar for Q. And, and by showing you that, I've proved that P, in fact, is a path set, because not every set of sequences is a path set. Uh, but P and Q both are. And if you interleave them together, what you do is you take um, all of the uh, elements of P and all of the elements of Q, and you just alternate the digits. Uh, and you could generalize this to three path sets or four path sets or however many you want. Uh, and it's fairly straightforward. Notice that the ones from P always come first. This operation is not commutative, one of the many very nice properties that this operation doesn't have. Um, there is a way to, to make this operation commutative if you were to, to do P into leaf Q and take the union with Q into leaf P. A few other ways you could do it would be taking the intersection or you could take the union of P and Q and then interleave it with itself. But the operation we're studying is just this straightforward one that isn't really, that is, that is not commutative. Okay, as I said, not every set of sequences is a path set. And my favorite example is just take all of the um, path sets over any alphabet that has zero in it and take all of the ones, all of the sequences that are eventually zero. That's not going to be a path set because you can't present it with a finite graph. But uh, the nice thing is that if you have a bunch of path sets and you interleave the path sets, the thing you're going to get is going to be a path set as well. And in fact, there is a construction uh, taking presentations of your original path sets and giving you a new one. So I'm going to sh show what that construction is using this example right here. So what you do is first you label the vertices, and then you start out, let, let's say I want to, to take this one, let's see, I think I, I want to take yeah, this one first. Um, so the first uh, vertex is going to be my initial vertex, and it will be um, XA. And the vertex on the right determines what the very next uh, edge labels can be. So in this case, A has two labels coming off of it. One is 0 and one is 1. And so I'm going to make two, uh, two edges coming off of this, one labeled 0 and one labeled 1. And then at that point, it's this guy's turn to decide what possible uh, edge labels can come next. And the only option is a 3. So I'm going to call this one AX. 
if you uh, if you start at A, then you go around and you're at A again. It's this guy's turn to decide what comes next. But then when it's this guy's turn again, A is going to be up again to decide what comes next. So you go ahead and once you're at that point, A X, there has to be a three. But then we're back to A. But now we're to but now the three takes you to Y. And so you take that Y there, and now you're at Y A. And what you do is you take uh, the the very last element, the one on the far right, you swing it over to the front, and then you replace it with uh, whatever your edge label goes to. So x, you replace it with y when you uh, swing it over there and then shove the a in front so that a can decide what to do next. And then, and then there's a uh, 1 or a 0, actually, this would be a 0. And then uh, uh, that would result in a 2. A Y here, and so you can see if I were to continue making it, this is the graph that I would end up with by that method. Now, a couple of things to note about this method are that first of all, it can blow up very quickly. The number of vertices uh, in our new presentation is the product of the numbers of vertices in each of our original presentations multiplied by the number of presentations. So, if we have three different path sets or let's say we have four different path sets, a pretty small number, right? And let's say each path set is presentable with only three vertices, also a very small example. Well, when we interleave these uh, things together, then most likely the resulting path set will have a minimal presentation with 324 vertices. So it flows up very fast, um, but that is not a number that it uh, definitely has because, as you can see in this example, uh, these two vertices, YB and BY, are actually equivalent in that they have the same follower set. So you could just identify them and replace those uh, twos going to each other with one self-loop. Now this vertex XB is never actually reachable from the initial vertex. If we had um, done the interleaving in the opposite direction with this one first and then this one, then this would actually be our initial vertex, and of course the initial vertex is reachable. But but given the way we've set it up, this vertex is just not reachable. And so you can cut that vertex out, you can identify these with each other, and then you only have six vertices. But in general, uh, it can be up to, and, and usually would be uh, the product of the numbers of vertices multiplied by the number of path sets. So, so these uh, questions in symbolic dynamics uh, arose because of questions in fractal geometry, which in turn arose because of questions in number theory, as Dr. Abram explained. The, uh, it started with a conjecture by Erdős that says that if you take uh, the powers of 2 and write them in their ternary expansions, they're all going to have the digit 2 in them except for 4, which is 1, 1, and I think 256, which also does not have the digit 2. But all of the other ones will. And uh, just from a probabilistic standpoint, if you would assume that the digits of the powers of 2 are completely randomly distributed with a uniform discrete distribution, then the probability is very high that this is true. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's so hard to prove, because there would have to be a reason for it not to be true. But of course, since the powers of 2 are not randomly distributed, they're you know, definite or determined, uh, you can't make a probabilistic argument like that uh, and have it be certain. So here's the weaker version, is just that there are finitely many powers of 2 that emit the digit 2. And here is uh, an equivalent conjecture that says if you go to the, the set uh, EZ3, or the threadic exceptional set, that is the set of all threadic numbers that if you multiply it by 2 to the n and take the threadic, uh, the uh, ternary or, or threadic expansion of that, then it will omit the digit 2. If it's true, if 1 is, is not in this set, then that means that well, just to forget the, the lambda there, 2 to the n, the threadic version of 2 to the n, will omit the digit 2 finitely many times if one is not in this set. So this is, uh, is equivalent to the weakened Erdős conjecture. This is not really equivalent to, to anything, but it's, it's related to this conjecture here, which is just that the Hausdorff dimension is 0. And, and Dr. Reaver explained that that's the, the problem that uh, we've kind of been pursuing. Uh, and we can associate a set of threadic integers to uh, 
a path set. Um, and if we can associate a set to a path set, we call it a triadic path set fractal. Uh, one example is the set of all triadic numbers that emit the digit 2 is a triadic path set fractal because you can just take one vertex with uh, the digits 0 and 1 and then it doesn't have 2 in it. Another example is if you take any positive triadic integer m, the set of triadic numbers that emit the digit 2 and still omit the digit 2 when multiplied by m is also a triadic path set fractal. And Dr. Abram talked about how you can take intersections of lots of those and, and it still gives you a triadic path set fractal. We can use graphs of path sets to calculate the Hausdorff dimensions of their associated fractals because uh, the Hausdorff dimension of a triadic path set fractal is just the base three log logarithm of the entropy of its associated path set. And entropy is easy to calculate for these things based on the spectral radius of the adjacency matrix. Um, here's uh, one nice theorem about the relationship between interleaving and entropy. It says that if you take a bunch of path sets that have known entropies and you interleave them together, the new path set is going to have the arithmetic mean of all of the original entropies. So that's a nice uh, property that uh, kind of helps you calculate the entropies when you interleave things. And that actually, uh, a special case of this for self-interleaving is that if you take a single path set and you interleave however many copies of it with itself that you want, it will end up with the same entropy as what you originally had. Now one of the approaches that uh, Dr. Abram and uh, Ligarius and uh, Bolshikov were trying to work with was to show that if you have a family of uh, numbers, uh, of triadic integers, that have infinitely many digits, or, or that, that who digit, the number of whose digits grow without bound, then uh, the Hausdorff dimension will go to zero if you take the, the dimension of things that uh, omit the digit 2 and will still omit the digit 2 if multiplied by those numbers. Well, and the powers of 2, they're digits, they're non-zero digits. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean non-zero digits, not just digits, because of course the, the digits grow without bound, but with the powers of 2, the non-zero digits grow without bound. And so it would be really nice if we could um, show that the Hausdorff dimension necessarily goes to zero, but in fact it does not. And so, uh, interleaving can be shown to prove this using the, this entropy property that says uh, there's a specific family of path sets that, um, or a specific family of path set fractals uh, of the form, uh, what, what they call C1M, which means these omit the digit 2 and still omit the digit 2 when you multiply it by M. And, and there's a specific uh, a family of, of numbers M that do have uh, unbounded non-zero digits, but they all have the same Hausdorff dimension that it's positive. And so that shows that that's one approach to solving this conjecture that it doesn't work. And so interleaving's claim to fame is that it showed that an approach for solving something wasn't going to work. Here is one nice property of self-interleaving that uh, is sort of related to multiplication. Uh, if you interleave something with itself n times and interleave that thing with itself m times, that's the same as interleaving the original thing n m times. So it comes with a sort of nice picture. Here's uh, itself, just uh, two copies of it. You get this. But if you interleave it four copies of it, you get this thing right here. And also, if you were to interleave this thing with itself, you would get that as well. So there are two different, uh, we might say, factorizations of this path set on the right. Okay, so uh, speaking of factorizations, we might be interested in looking at a path set and trying to see if we can figure out whether uh, certain path sets are interleaved to give us this path set. So for example, let's suppose we just had this path set P interleaved Q and, and we call it some other name, say A. And we want to know whether we could, wh whether we could have arrived at this path set A by interleaving two path sets. And if so, we want to find out what those two path sets are. Well, what we can do is we can look at the all possible sequences of even digits in P and all, all or in, in, in this set A uh, and look at all possible sequences of odd digits and then we can get these path sets P and Q. And when we interleave them back together, we get the exact same thing that we started with. And so we could, if, if we didn't have P and Q but we just had this third path set, we could kind of go backwards to find out what two things could have been interleaved to get at this third thing. On the other hand, 
uh, this isn't true for every uh, path set. Let's say we started with Q, and let's say we look at the sequences of odd digits and the sequences of even digits, and here's what we get. Well, we inter when we interleave those things together, we get something different, something that strictly contains our original path set. And so, in general, it does not hold that uh, you can decimate and interleave back together and you will get what you started with, but you will get something that strictly contains what you started, or not strictly, that, that contains what you started with. And sometimes that containment is proper and sometimes it's not. So there is an algorithm to find, a, if you have a path set, there's an algorithm to decimate it however many ways you want. So I split it up two ways. You could, you could decimate it three ways or four or however many and interleave them back together and try to see what you get. And it does turn out that when you decimate uh, however many different ways you want, the individual paths that you get will in fact be path sets. So uh, given a presentation of P, we can check for any N whether there exist path sets P0, P0 through uh, Pn minus 1 that can be interleaved together to get us to P. Um, the question is, what if you've checked a bunch and none of them have worked? There are path sets. In fact, probably most path sets are irreducible. You can never decimate them two ways, three ways, four ways, or any number of ways and interleave back together to get what you started with. But how do you know? How, how, how do you know that you're done, that you've done enough? Well, there's a theorem uh, that we uh, came up with that says if you have a path set that has m vertices, and you've already tried all the way up through m minus 1, so let's say it has 30 vertices, you split it up two ways, you interleave them back together, you don't get what you started with, you split it up three ways, you interleave them back together, you don't get what you started with, and all the way up through splitting it up 29 ways, and you don't get what you started with. Um, then you know that you can finally stop. And by that point, it's probably taken you a couple million years to do it because our algorithms are so complicated. But you can feel satisfied that you've spent that million years well and you now have a, a satisfactory conclusion. So um, here's the way of proving it is to say that if you have a non-monotonous path set, and that path set, uh, let's see, and, and that path set can be broken down as the interleaving of n path sets, then your presentation of P needs to have at least n plus 1 vertices. So if you have a non and I'll tell you in a minute what a non-monotonous path set is, if P is a non-monotonous path set that has, uh, that, that can be broken down into the interleaving of 30 different things or more, then it's going to have, have to have at least 31 vertices. So if you see that you have 30 vertices and you've tried uh, all the way up to 29, you know it's not going to work. So we just use that to prove this. And the way of proving that is to say, let's suppose that we uh, don't, let's see, don't just label all of the vertices differently. But let's suppose we have, let's suppose we want to interleave path sets together, and I'm just going to use as an example this, uh, this simple example right here. So here are my two path sets. Uh, this is a countable path set, and this is a singleton path set. Um, and if I want to interleave them together, what I can do is I can label the vertices, but instead of giving them all distinct labels, I'm going to look at their follower sets and give two vertices the same label if they have the same follower set. So I notice that these two have the same follower set, so I'm going to call that follower set B, right? Only a two can come out of it. And then I'm going to do this, this interleaving operation, and I'm going to interleave them together. And um, I guess I should tell you what a non what a non monotonous path set is. Well, a path set is monotonous essentially if there is only one possible vertex path. So if there are uh, multiple vertex paths in one of the factors of, of of what I'm about to come up with, then what I'm about to come up with will also have multiple vertex paths, and, and vice versa. So. And so that's why I have uh, two vertex paths, or, or multiple vertex paths, because you can take this vertex any number of times before going here. Okay, well, when I interleave these together, at some point you're going to have to make a choice between two possible vertices. Maybe you're going to go back to the same one, or maybe you're going to go to two different ones. It doesn't matter. I just know that there are two different vertices that you're going to get. So you could end up with A, and then something. I'm just going to use an X to denote something. And then you could, and, and it could be either B or A before that thing. And then from here, 
x goes to something else, call that thing y, and then move your a forward, and x goes to b, move that forward. And of course, we could do this with, uh, with any number of uh, path sets, and then we would just have a bunch of x's or, or you know, x, y, z. Uh, but in this case, we'll just do this. Well, I want to show that here, we need to have, you know, we, we don't know what x and y are, and maybe x is the same as b, or x is the same as a, but we want to show that there are at least, let's see, we have two path sets, so we want to show that there are at least three different vertices among all of these. And so what you end up having is you have some sort of, you can think of it sort of as, as if you have two matrices. And let me kind of make a more general case where we have maybe three, uh, three vertices instead of two. And these x's aren't necessarily the same. I'm just kind of using x to denote whatever happens to be there. So here I used x and, and y. But uh, what's key to notice is that these two x's uh, need to be the same as these two, and these two need to be the same as these two, because the only difference that we've made is that we've gone to uh, vertex A instead of vertex B, or B instead of A. But everything else with all of the other path sets, we can choose to do it in exactly the same way. So I want to show that we have if we have, in general, if we have n of these, that's n by n, I want to show that there are at least n plus 1 different, um, different vertices between all of these. And of course we have to worry, like in the example we showed earlier, that two follower sets, that, that two vertices could have exactly the same follower set. But these, will, these vertices will have the same follower set only if um, all of the uh, decimations of their followers that are the same. So these two vertices could be identified only if this x is the same as this x, and this x is in fact a, and this x is in fact a. And you know you could take any of these two and you could identify them only if all of the x's happen to line up with whatever they correspond with. So uh, the idea is we prove this by induction that we have to have at least n plus one of these things once we've identified all of the identical follower sets. To do that, Let's see. Uh, we can take our base case when we only have two, and, and that's fairly easy to show. So I won't I won't do that one. But I'll just assume let's assume that we have um, that that our theorem holds for n minus one. Well, I can look at these, and I have actually the exact same structure, but it, instead of n by n, I have n minus one by n minus one, and so I know that among these there are at least n. Uh, different vertices, even if I don't look at the these ones right here. So bx and xb um, you know, might be the same, but these two are different. And, but for, for right now, I'll just assume these are the same. Well, when my very last one comes along, I need to show that e either uh, that one of these at least provides something new, or that one of these uh, somehow breaks an equivalence that we already have. Well, if we assume that these do, that neither of these provides anything new, that both of these are equivalent to some other thing, then let's just say that this is equivalent to that, and this is equivalent to that. It doesn't matter if it's uh, in the same kind of set or a different one. Well, then we know that these two things have the same x's, right? These two x's are the same as these two, even though b is different from a, but that's the only difference. So if this is the same as this, then then uh, this b must be the same as this x, and this x must be the same as this one, in addition to these things being the same. But then if we look at this, then these two must also be the same as these x's, and so by transitivity, these must be the same as these, but then we have a b here, and we have an a here, and so we break a, a, uh, an equivalence that we already had previously, thereby giving us a new one. Five minutes. Five minutes? OK. So that's essentially how you prove this uh, theorem here. And it tells us that we kind of have a, a time that we can finally stop. That's just sort of a, a rough uh, kind of sketch of the proof for a specific case. But uh, you can generalize that fairly easily. OK, so, so a path set is monotonous, as I said, if um, there is only one infinite vertex path on the graph beginning at the marked initial vertex. 
Um, here's uh, our technical definition of a monotonous path set, but there are a lot of equivalent definitions. One of the nice things about monotonous path sets is that if you split it up, uh, you, you can split it up however many ways you want and interleave them back together to get you the same path set. Um, a, a monotonous path set, by the way, its uh, vertex path is going to have a specific structure. And it's going to have a structure that I call an appended circle, which means the vertex path is going to have to look something like something like this, where you have your initial vertex and then you go to several other vertices and finally come back to where you started. And, uh, and you keep going around in a circle. And so a monotonous path set will have a structure that looks something like that. Uh, there, there could be uh, multiple vertices here, or sorry, multiple edges, um, but there's only one vertex path. If there were not multiple edges, then this is actually an example of what Dr. Abram was talking about earlier with self-similarity, where a path set will be uh, self-similar because there is only one uh, loop, and the loop is reachable by only one possible path. So a monotonous path set uh, could be considered in some ways a generalization of the Cantor set, or it could be associated to uh, generalizations of, of Cantor-like sets in you know, three-attic or, or p-attic uh, domains, or in the real numbers, or whatever you like. Also, all factors of p are monotonous. And so here we have uh, all the possible definitions of monotonous path sets, and it shows that they have some really nice properties. And uh, since uh, interleaving preserves entropy, we can use en entropy, or we can use interleaving to look at how uh, dimension behaves un under these operations. So uh, questions for future work. Uh, like I said, it could take you, if you have a, a, even a relatively small example, it could take you a very, very long time to de demonstrate for certain that it's irreducible. So is there a faster way to do that? Would it help to assume uncountable vertex paths? The uh, theorem that I gave is maximal in the sense that uh, it, it's impossible to, to break it or, or to make a strictly better bound, but uh, the counterexample for a better bound has a countable number of vertex paths. So if you assume that there's an uncountable number of vertex paths, maybe you could get a vastly better bound. When is it possible for a path set to have multiple non-trivial factorizations? We looked at that example earlier, where if you interleaved something with itself and then with itself again, you got the same thing as if you interleave the same thing four times. So then it has two, two non-trivial factorizations. But are there any other situations where that could happen? And then uh, what do, a question I just started thinking about this week was, what do decimation equivalence classes look like? So, if, so two path sets might have the same decimations, uh, but they might be different path sets. Uh, likely one would contain the other, uh, but maybe not. I don't know. So would that always need to be the case? If, to, if you can decimate a path set, say, two different ways, and uh, you interleave it back together, you get something different. Well, then your original path set and the, dip, and the new path set you've got both uh, are equivalent in the sense of just looking at their decimations, at least if you only look at their uh, two decimations or their three decimations. So what do those equivalence classes look like? And uh, those are the main questions I have. Thank you very much. Yeah. Are these the same thing as finite automata coming out of formal languages in computer science? They just feel the exact, like the exact same thing. Um, I think they're very similar, if not okay. the same. Okay. In which case, I think there's an answer yes to your first question of if there's a faster way to do it. And okay. the person I talked to would be Jeff Shalek, because he, if you can formally phrase a question about finite automata a certain way, there's algorithms you can do that are really fast to answer it. Okay. Um, first person to talk to would be Jeff Shalek at Waterloo. Okay. Good. Thank you.